Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kirsten Marzi, and I'm the Manager of Education and Community Engagement Programs at Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. It's my pleasure to be your host for tonight's artist talk with B. Lynch, followed by a Q&A with all of you. Admission for this program is pay as you wish. If you would like to donate to Brattleboro Museum and Art Center to support this and future arts programs, you can do so at brattleboromuseum.org support or at the link uh, in the chat. You'll also find more information about membership on that page as well. This event is presented in connection with the exhibit Pull Back the Curtain, which is on view through February 13th at BMAC. In tonight's program, B. Lynch will give a talk about her exhibit and her world of the reds and the grays. You are welcome to ask questions at any time, and we will save time at the end for B. Lynch to answer them. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask B. Lynch to join me on screen. The plan is that she will speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to your questions and comments. To submit a question or comment, if you're here via Zoom, please use the Q&A button on your screen. You can do that at any time, and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can type your questions or comments there, and we'll keep an eye on that too. All right, with that housekeeping taken care of, I'd like to ask Bee to turn on her camera and mic now while I introduce her. Storytelling how society works through art, Bee Lynch embellishes, makes fun of, and wonders at the societal friction in our new gilded age of income disparity. Her theatrical mixed media installations about the fantastical universe of the reds and the grays have been shown extensively in New England, most recently at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, and her videos have been screened across the country and in Germany, and she was featured in the group exhibition Storied References at the Northern Illinois University Art Museum in winter of 2021. She is a recipient of several awards, including the President's Fund for Faculty Excellence Award at Simmons University in Boston, where she formally directed the Trustman Art Gallery, a fellow award from the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and an Artist Resource Trust Award from the Berkshire Taconic Foundation, and a project grant from the Ludwig Vogelstein Foundation in Shelter Island, New York. The Massachusetts Cultural Council Artsake blog published the Three Stages series on the new Gilded Age project. Her installations sprawl over several media the content is the glue. For the ongoing red and gray work, the simple materials of paper, wire, and paint underpin the objects. The two-dimensional works are portraits of the characters. Video and sound animate the drawings and objects. Lynch lives and works in Jamaica Plain, a neighborhood of Boston, in a handmade house and studio with a garden of fruits, vegetables, and flowers. You can find more information at her website BeeLynchArt.com. B, Bee, thank you for being here tonight. It's great to see you. And same. I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Oh, I want to thank you, Kirsten. And I also want to thank everyone at the museum, uh, particularly Mara Williams as the curator for my project, and Sarah Freeman, who have <clears throat> problem solved all my issues throughout the entire exhibition installation. And I so enjoy working with everyone. The way I think I'll do this talk today is um, I have a slideshow prepared and I'm gonna share the screen and um, talk as I go. So, um, here we go. Okay, um, I want to welcome everyone, if you can make it in person to my show entitled Pull Back the Curtain at the Brattleboro Art Museum. And, uh, but I also want to talk about how I um, make the work and what I'm thinking about during this project. And my figures um, in this fantastical world that I, oh dear, it's not advancing. There we go. The fantastical world of the reds and grays are situated in two different time periods. 
the reds, which we see on the left, belong in the 18th century. Their clothing is that wonderful design sense that they had in the 18th century. And their objects are the marvelous things that we see so often in museums around the world. Now, the grays, they are a make-do society. They're not living in the 18th century. In fact, we're not quite sure where they're living. They seem to be inhabiting a place that is more amorphous. It's definitely not as luxurious as the Red's Palace. But the Gray's costuming is also not as gorgeous either. It's more or less a simple uniform, a gray outfit, very um, practical for all the work they're doing because what they do is work and they work for the Reds. But their technology seems to be 20th century. So this is a sort of what is going on experience that I'm hoping to give you as a viewer because I'm time bending. I'm smashing up the 18th century reds with a time period that could be early 20th century, could be a refugee camp, could be some post-apocalyptic time. But yet these two factions seem to coexist somehow in this world that I've created. How did I get going and doing all of this stuff? Well, I have to say that as an undergrad, when I was studying in Japan, my um, experience there, because my main study was actually of uh, traditional Japanese theater, has had a really great influence on my work over the years. So on the left, we see... Um, a no theater actor. And no is a very, uh, one of the oldest traditional um, forms of theater in Japan. And he's wearing a mask. So that's one of the things that no is known for are masks. On the right, we see a bunraku puppet. Now, these puppets are about two thirds life size. And they're manipulated by three animators. Now, the really strange thing is when you watch one of these puppet shows, you don't even see three people moving around the puppets. And they, too, have marvelous costumes, much like the no um, actors. And the third form that I spent quite a bit of time working with is um, kabuki. I went to a lot of performances. I made some little kabuki dolls. And one of the things about kabuki is it's live action. All the actors are male. And it was incredibly popular as a theatrical um, form. And it was popular, including during my 18th century. But uh, one of the things that Kabuki did to uh, make itself popular was to utilize the, uh, the print medium. So artists would create these uh, reproducible prints of the actors in their famous roles. And by doing this, they created a sort of um, uh, commodity of the actors for the theaters and um, made them famous. Now, I too am creating a cast of characters, a theatrical event in my um, installations and videos. And so I decided that I would um, 
cannibalize the idea of prints and create uh, block prints of my um, figures or my uh, cast. So here's a couple uh, versions of them. So on the left, we see the Wolfman. Now, Wolfman is, as you can see, he has a wolf's head, but he has a man's body. And he always has his book. In my universe, all the various um, characters, red and gray, have certain identifiers. So that even though I change medium frequently as I explore my ideas, there is some consistency to each of the characters. So Wolfman has his book and he's telling it like it is. Now, on the right, we see um, the judge and he is, um, whoops, he is holding his death's head. And um, we know that he's a kind of scary character as well. Now, one of the other theatrical um, inspirations I have had is the Commedia del Art. Now, this was a form of theater that got started in the late Renaissance and ran throughout the Baroque all over Europe, began in Italy. And the interesting thing about the Commedia del Art was that there, it was an improv troupe. It was the characters themselves that gave the impetus to their performance. Each character had a particular thing about them, their habit of thought and action that could be relied upon for the other characters to play against. So there was no real script. So in a way, I've taken that upon myself with my reds and grays. Each of the characters kind of creates, in a sense, its own aura in which, as I put another character next to them, they have to um, interact. So on the right, on the left, we see Comedia del Arte figures, and on the right, we see Dandy. And Dandy is one of my favorite characters. And he's easily identifiable because he always wears this black poofy hat and a black cape, a red and gold outfit, and he's of portly build. He also is rather pleased with himself. So we see him here in a pen and ink rendition. And the rendition is out of the toy theater concept. And for the Brattleboro, I put together a Reds toy theater. But the first toy theater um, was for my grays. And so here we see on the left, we see a version of the toy theater uh, with its full proscenium. And um, the fun thing about a toy theater, it uses a little bit of forced perspective. So it creates a receding concept when you look at it. So here we can see on the right a little bit more of a detail with several of the gray figures. The reason I got interested in the toy theater was when I was in Germany, I saw several versions of it. In the 18th century, the theater um, people would put together these special uh, toy theaters for adults that would um, uh, memorialize a particularly interesting part of a play or opera. Well, as it the toy theater moved into the 19th century. It also acquired a more playful children's aspect to it. And the theaters uh, were more like paper dolls in which children could play with them. So my toy theater is a bit of a mashup of both of these things. 
Um, let me show you what I put together for Brattleboro. Of course, the reds have to be in a much more beautiful and exciting palatial place. So the sets I made for the reds are quite different than the sets I made for the grays. So we see right smack dab in the middle, Vanita. Oh, Vanita, the best thing she does is to look in her mirror. That is the best thing she sees. Vanita is always identified with her mirror and her um, wonderful hairdo. And we see beyond her into the palatial park out the window, a version of um, Diana the Huntress with her bows and arrows. Now here's another view of the um, toy theater. And we see centered in the um, slide, the writer. And so he's always identified, he has his books and he's in a library, it looks like, or a place where more books are. And we see um, he has some beautiful things. And at the forefront, we see the dandy. All of these figures, just to give you an idea of scale, these figures are about eight inches tall. So the toy theater itself is not very large, but I did enjoy making elaborate, elaborate drawings of both the figures and their milieu. So here are the rest of the, the um, characters from the toy theater. On the left, we see the cook and she's great. What is she doing in a Red's toy theater? Well, of course, if you are Red, you need your servants and the greys serve the Reds. So she's kind of hidden in the background but she's a very necessary part of the household, even if the Reds don't acknowledge it. And on the right, we see the, the dandy. And here we have two full-length views of both Vanita and the writer. Now, one of the things, this is a, a installation view of um, the exhibition at the museum. And one of the things I really wanted to do with this show was make manifest the different kinds of resources the reds and the grays had at their disposal. So one of the ways I did this was to actually create architecture for them so we could see it in a physical way not just through my images, but in a physical way. And this is the first time I've ever really done something like this. Uh, most of my other installations, although they are set within a definite and a clear milieu, they are not architectural. They are more abstracted. But on the left, we see, of course, the palace of the Reds. And we only see half the palace. It's so big that it can't fit into the entire frame. It's also taller than we see. So we can see through into the window a little bit and further on into the palace from that view. And on the right, we see the carpenter's shop and it is much smaller. The carpenter has to make do with what he can. And we see outside the shop, one of my figures and he's another worker and he's pushing a cart full of rocks with his pickaxe. And you may notice that he is wearing on his head 
a tin pot. Now, why is that? Well, it's funny, first of all. But secondly, it speaks to the make-do world that the greys inhabit. They don't have the luxury of many, many things. So a tin pot acts as a hard hat. It also acts as a cooking pot and also a pot from which to eat one's dinner. Now, William Hogarth was an 18th century artist in England, and he called himself a visual dramatist. That is something I wanted to take on for myself. So I'm stealing that from Hogarth because I think it applies to me as well. The 18th century is an interesting place for me to situate my reds. And William Hogarth was equally aware of things in his society that he wanted to comment on. So he created various painting series and print series, such as the Rake's Progress, in which he created a cast of characters in which things happened. And I really liked that idea. What about the 18th century? It's kind of a century where it's the worst of times and the best of times. In Europe, there is a lot of money flowing in to the upper classes and royalty, the aristocrats. It's flowing from the colonies. It's flowing from the slave trade. The rich are very, very rich. And those that are not are very much at the mercy of the rich. Now, what's interesting about the 18th century is not only this vast wealth, but all of a sudden, an increase in ideas that began to contemplate other things. Maybe a monarchy wasn't the best form of government. Maybe there was something called human rights. All of these things were roiling around together in the 18th century, creating tension. And if we think about it, a couple of revolutions. So I, too, wanted to take on this ability to have social commentary in my work. And, I, and I've chosen to do a number of different ways to approach this. So I just want to talk a little bit about Vanita here. She's in a block print. And we see her Marie Antoinette hairdo. And we see her mirror again. We also see the knitter, who is one of her attendants in several of my installations. And as I mentioned before, high-born people need their attendants. So the knitter sits in the background with her red wool knitting away. Now, one of the things that's really fun about creating the architecture in the Brattleboro Museum is not only making the figures, these figurines are about 10 inches tall, and this is a view of the palace that is in the museum. So I really enjoyed making all the things that go into a proper gentleman's study. On the left, we see another version of the writer in gouache paint. 
So one of the things I like to do because it affords me the opportunity to um, think more deeply about the characters I am creating and to maybe create a little different or nuance in the way I wish to present them is to not only make block prints, but digital um, constructions, video, and gouache paintings. So uh, the writer was made after I had made the architecture. So this is um, a very new painting. And you can see how closely it mimics much of the palace. One of the things I'm afraid I'm, I'm guilty of is I'm always incestuously um, grabbing work from one medium into the other. So I like to take a form that I've created one place and reuse it. But just to talk a little bit of more about this 3D palace I've created, we see right behind the writer a little painting. Now, this is an ink version of a Greek Dionysus or Bacchus. An 18th century um, aristocrat would be very interested in Greek and Roman mythology and theater and stories. And so, of course, that seemed like the right kind of image to put into one, uh, into his study. And um, all the paintings in the palace are uh, digital shrunk versions of things I have done in the past that I thought worked for the palace, except for one which is painted in the true size. We also see the books on the table, the books in the background, and a little bit of a hint of his tricorn hat. Now here we are still in the palace. And we're in the music room looking in to the study. So you see a little bit over here on the right down lowest right corner, uh, the spinet, which we see by turning around is in the music room. And we see the double bass leaning up against the wall. And this painting is actually of a Commedia dell'arte figure playing a guitar. And then in the background here, we also see a version of a Chinese sage because the, at this time period in the 18th century, uh, the, uh, the moneyed classes were very interested in trade with China. Think of tea, also ceramics. So we have uh, beautiful things that are imported in the palace. And then over the mantelpiece, we see the small scale painting that I actually painted to be in scale for this. Another view of the table with his books and items on it. And on the right, his comfy chair with a pillow. And we can see the um, the vases, the Chinese uh, style vases on the mantelpiece. And we also see in this version, another, another picture of Bacchus. And I don't think I mentioned this, why Bacchus is important, but many people know he's the God of wine, but perhaps you didn't know he's also the God of theater. And because I'm creating with this show a theatrical experience, or at least I hope it's theatrical, I wanted to make him, uh, give him a prominent place. And on the right, we see a, another version of Dandy. This is in gouache as well. And we can see that he has the poofy hat and the cape and the red and gold and the portly build. Um, I, as I said, like to reiterate different versions of my cast. 
And here we see him again. And I think I need to move this down so you can see that, in fact, his uh, right behind him is another portrait of him over the mantelpiece in the Red Theater. And we also see a view of the cook coming in through a back door there. So very recursive, but um, for me, I have fun with it. Now in the um, Gray's carpenter shop, I also had a tremendous amount of fun making things. And uh, we see on the right a version of the carpenter before he got his entire shop. He was just working away there. And he has a three-legged stool that he's working on. We can see his drill and hammer on his workbench. And on the left, we see a gouache painting of the carpenter working away. And I want you to note this little saw there because we'll see it again and this cabinet um so uh you know it's pretty plain stuff that he's working with and here we see a view inside the shop and we see that he's acquired a few more things he has a um a wood stove in the back he has a broom to clean up his mess and a little um, broom pan. He has more tools on his workbench. He has his tin pot hat. And uh, to the right, he has a very narrow bed and a room for him to sleep in. Here's a close-up of his uh, workbench. And we can see more easily some of the tools. And he's working on a box now. Oh, I want to go back. If you can see in the background there, there's the completed three-legged stool. So he does finish his projects. Uh, and we see he has a, a mallet and his box that he's working on. And there's the drill and the hammer again. So... Carpenter works hard, but he doesn't have a lot of resources. Here we see his wood stove. And yes, the door opens and closes. And we see on the left uh, a little um, wood rack for him to feed the stove. One of the things I like to do with these small characters and their objects around them is things work. So the stove door opens and closes. That cart I spoke about that the man was pushing with the rocks and the um, pickaxe in, it actually rolls rather badly, I must say, but it does roll. There's something about making things work that I find interesting when I make the work. Now, if we look from this side, this is the uh, other side, the side that you would look in from the interior of the gallery. We see the back of the carpenter. We see his cabinet, and there's a fro on top, which is a certain type of tool to split wood. And that cabinet came from the painting. I made the painting first, but then when I wanted to populate the carpenter shop, I decided it needed to go in there. And then we see that little saw hanging there that I mentioned before. So one of the things that I really wanted to do with this exhibit is the ticket gallery is fantastic. If you want to think of about it as a little tiny stage in and of itself, on the outside, there are two windows and you get to look into the palace or you get to look into the carpenter shop. You come into the gallery. In addition to the other things that are in the gallery, you get another view of both of the um, both the 
palatial uh, palace and the modest carpenter shop. So if you do get the opportunity to go to the exhibit, I hope you enjoy looking through the windows uh, on both sides. Now, one of the things that uh, was part of my idea from the very beginning with my figures was the notion that I wanted to make video. Now, when you're going to be creating an entire world, I've been working on this for nine years, it takes a while until you get enough of a cast and enough of the ideas and situations that you want them to interact with to begin to create video. So I, I've been making them for about two years. With I've been making video a lot longer, but I've been making the videos about the, the reds and the grays for about two years. And I decided to make a whole new series for the Brattleboro. So what we see here is kind of a cast list of the reds. And they're on a chess board because the name of the series I created for Brattleboro is chess set, game one, game two, and game three. So this is a still. And here is a, another still from the Gray's perspective. And we see Wolfman and Gam with his book, The Cook. And we see Digger with his shovel. Now I'm going to show you a... Um, a very short 30 second preview of the um, of the um, chess set. And it's it's just to give you an idea of how I put the videos together. And just let me adjust the sound. Share sound, we should be good. And here we go. <laughs> now I'm going to come back and get us back into the slideshow, hopefully. There we go. And um, oops. So here's another um, scene from one of the videos, and this is the vizier. You may have noticed that the wolfman is not exactly an ordinary guy. Well, the reds also have a magical leader or character, and this is the horseman. And he, like the wolfman, has very big teeth. These two are um, in opposition throughout much of the chess set um, games, but not entirely. There's, there's some, some different things that happen as we go through all three videos. The videos themselves are uh, like three, three and two minutes, something like that. So here we see one of their battles, the bloody battle between the wolfman in the background. And in the foreground, I'm wearing a mask. That's me in a costume much like the vizier's. And uh, so through the magical digital world, I'm able to put myself at basically the same place as my 10 inch wolfman, even though I'm five foot, almost two inches tall. Now, um, a character that is different in the Reds 
is the aeronaut. And we see him in the background here uh, where I'm giving this talk. And here he is flying over the scenery and there's a chess set spread out below him. And we're not really sure. Is he on reconnaissance? Is he just having a pleasurable day trip? Is it scientific inquiry? We don't really know, but he's above it all. Here we have a, a detailed view of him. And just so you know, I didn't make it up. The 18th century, the late 18th century was when the idea of hot air balloons finally um, took off, so to speak. And why am I doing this? Well, one of the things that has worried me and made me think about is the disparity of income and resources in our country and in the world. And so I had this graphic to just give you a pretty um, definite look at how um, CEOs, difference in pay varies throughout the world. And this graphic is not completely up to date, but it's just so entirely clear. It seems still worth using, though no doubt it's worse. So we see in the United States that the CEO makes 354 times what the average worker makes. We see in Poland, they make 28 times more. Well, an interesting thing is that in the 1960s, in our country, CEOs made something in the 20s or uh, more than the average worker. So since those 50 years have gone by, the ballooning of pay has really become marked. So um, this is part of the, the impetus between, between um, the reds and the grays thinking. But I wanted to ask the question, where are we going? Where are we going with this society? And who do we want to be? And in game three, I offer perhaps a different way than violence. I don't know, but I want us to think about it. And I'd like to thank you very much for listening to my talk. And I'm looking forward to questions and answers. Thank you so much. That was really a wonderful tour through the exhibit and your work and all the different characters and the reds and the grays. So that was, thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple questions. Eve Jacobs Carnahan asks, what are the 3D characters made of? Ah, that's an excellent question. Um, I gave myself some constraints. I think many artists, particularly in a sprawling project, like to do that. And my constraint was that the 3D figurines would be made primarily of wire, paper, and paint, including also all their little objects. So they are um, kind of a little wonky in a way because it's not a plastic medium. It's not like clay. It bites me to some degree, but I like that. I think it gives it more, uh, gives the characters themselves more emotional punch because they're not perfect. And you see them from different angles and they look differently. And that's particularly wonderful when you're setting them up we're doing video work with them. I hope that is clear enough. That's great, thank you. And for anyone who's 
wanting to submit questions, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom, or you can put a question in the comments on Facebook, and we'll get to them here. Um, we have a comment from Marvin, and he says, it's a pleasure to see you. Sue says, hi as well. Be well. <laughs> hi, Marv. <laughs> so that was nice. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you know, there's all these characters and these different worlds that you have um, that you kind of weave in and out of through these little vignettes. Have you thought of any um, or, or written a story for the Reds and the Grays or do you leave that up to the visitors or the viewers? That is a, a great question. I The reason the videos don't have dialogue is for the visitor to construct their own narrative. And uh, in fact, um, I don't like to give out too much information. I want you to take it in and see what you see. But I do stack the deck a little bit because I use, particularly in the videos, I, I create with the soundtrack. And the soundtrack has emotional flavor to it. And it gives you ideas, even though there is no written dialogue. So yes, I may have a concept, but even my concept to some degree is modeled as I go. I never create a real script. In fact, I often create the sound first because I know what currents of emotional thuggery I want to do on people. And then I create the images to go with it. I have a shot list and uh, do that. But and then the the digital images are similar in that they reference ideas I have about uh, the reds and grays. Mm, that's great. Um, I was also wondering how you name the characters. Some of the characters have names, some have titles that you refer to them as. How do you decide on a name for a character? Well, um, a lot of times they first start out with just their, um, their role, what they do, like Vanita. That's vanity, right? So she's always looking at her mirror. And then other characters get named different things in different situations. Like I have a cleaning lady who I have named, who often gets the name Lily in the videos. And this arises because my niece, when I was first starting to make this project, she wanted to name everybody. And I, we would just go through and she would come up with these great names and I liked the names. And so some of the times when it's appropriate that they have a name within a piece, I use my, my niece's uh, ideas. It's a collaborative project. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Um, I was also wondering about the color choice. So the red, red and gray are really evocative colors. I wonder how you landed on those for the two worlds. Well, I think red is a color that um, we associate with um, power you know, gold with power. So the reds outfit is always red and gold. But I also, um, for the grays, that's nondescript. It's kind of without power in a sense. Yet at the same time, I'm setting up this push back and forth between these two factions. And I'm so I'm giving them equal weight. But I also didn't want to have, I think this is, this is something that we see throughout history, this push of power and wealth, and people without power and wealth, and how they respond, whether they're happy in their situation, or they decide to have a resistance. And so um, 
I didn't want to create any kind of particular racial description with skin color. So red is red and gray is gray. And, you know, you can put on that any place or time that you wish. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have another question from the audience. Um, this person asked, could you tell us more about the knitter? What is she up to? Uh, well, the knitter, I like to read a lot. And um, in the tale of two cities, which is Dickens' story about the French Revolution, there is a woman who sits at the bottom of the guillotine and she knits. So that was one of my ideas. So here she's in the palace. She's an attendant to Benita, but she's knitting. It's sort of a little creepy. But on the other hand, she's just an old woman and she's making useful things. And the red wool she's using, is she making things for the reds? Or is this something she makes that she gets to bring back when she goes back to the Greys camp because she has resources serving in the palace that others do not? So we're really not sure what she is um, doing, but she uh, could be a little bit subversive. Mm -hmm. Does that answer? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I love that. The I remembering that scene and the tale of two cities and thinking about the kind of like the yeah the creepiness or the plotting there as well as kind of the innocuous nature of knitting. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question. Uh, what happened nine years ago that got you started on this project? Uh, I had finished up um, my MFA mm -hmm. and had finished up the project I had been working on for a while. And uh, it, it takes me a while to get into new projects. And really, when I started this, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea that all these many years later, I would be so involved with this. So what I made was I made the vizier or the horseman, the guy with the big teeth who's in the Reds camp. And I just liked him. Ooh, I thought he's cool. And then I made um, another Red. And uh, I can't remember if it was the queen or the, the soldier. But, and I liked him too, but I thought, Gee, it's all going one way here. And so I often in my projects like a dichotomy. So I decided to um, work on what would be the antithesis of these characters. And at this point, I had nothing to do with the 18th century or any of the many of the ideas I talked about today. It was just a sort of visual and visceral response and talk about visceral, my very first gray character. And he had all the attributes, he had the costume, he had the tin pot hat. He's laying abjectly on the ground and his guts are coming out. It was a little scary, but uh, I think it was in a certain sense an encapsulation of my fear for the grays. And then I started making other gray characters and um, began to, to build up the world. But the really big breakthrough for this project was I got invited by um, the Northampton Historic Museum to uh, work with them as a, um, on an installation using their collection. And their collection is very different than many museums in that they have many beautiful things and from the 18th century, which is how I sort of decided to squat there for my reds, many beautiful things. But they also, interestingly, 
for most museums, they have material objects from everyday life. They have pots and pans and and many of the things that actually um, carpenters tools, many of the things that have become incorporated into my gray world. And working with them, even though the project was very tiny at the time, sort of gave me what I wanted to do. It was like a seed. It was. That's great. Um, I was thinking as you were talking about the, the power of these two groups and what power the reds have and what power the grays have. And, um, and I feel like technology is one difference where the, the grays may have an advantage. Can you speak to why you gave the, the grays um, like modern technology? Well, it's not that super modern. It's over 100 years old, basically. But uh, it's partly is because uh, I was thinking about the Depression mm -hmm. in, in the early 20th century. And also partly because in the early 20th century, there was a time of the robber barons. And there was a lot of wealth. But at the same time, the... the um, proletariat, so to speak, were beginning to realize that their numbers gave them power. Mm -hmm. So there was another famous revolution at that time period. And we also realized at that time that other countries, including our own, realized this could get out of hand. And so they started to make laws that, you know, limited the 80 hours a week and um, terrible working conditions and, and such that the grays, so to speak, had to suffer through because all of a sudden it became clear that um, things were out of whack. And I hope that answers. Yeah, I think it's really um, interesting how you uh, reference these historical moments through the objects and the attire of the, the characters so that it's all of that is there kind of um, under the surface uh, for people that are interested to explore. Um, and so I think with that, I'll, I'll transition a little bit and encourage everyone who's been participating in this talk or sees it afterwards, please come to the museum and see B. Lynch's exhibit, Pull Back the Curtain. It's on view through February 13th. It's just amazing to see these pieces in person, the um, little, the um, scenes that have been set, the characters, the video. Um, it's a really immersive installation. So I really encourage you to come see it. Um, it's definitely one you wanna see in person. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up the Q&A there. Um, I just want to let everyone know before we sign off that a recording of tonight's program will be available on our website within the next day or two, and that's at brattleboromuseum.org. And while you're there, you can check out the recordings of other events that we've presented online over the past year. And you can find those under events and then video archive. And if you happen to be in the Brattleboro area, again, I really encourage you to come to the museum for an in-person art experience. We're open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to four, and admission is on a pay-as-you-wish basis. Um, and finally, if you enjoyed tonight's program and would like to make a donation to support this type of programming, we would be very grateful. You can do that at brattleboromuseum.org slash support. Um, so I think that's it. It was a true pleasure, B. Lynch. Thank you so much. And mm -hmm. thank you everyone who joined us tonight. Um, take care and stay safe and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.